that will take time. Until that's clear, no other country really is going to be um, in a position to build on that trade agreement, because that's generally speaking going to be the baseline. They want to know how the UK relates to the EU. And then, only then, you have to choose what are the one or two countries you want to negotiate an FTA with. So if you wanted to tap the Commonwealth with 52 countries, even if you just wanted to focus on those five, that is still at least a decade in the making. Um, but uh, just to kind of, uh, just to wrap up, I know I'm, I'm out of time, um, is that um, there's, I, I always want to end on a, on a bright note because, you know, the sun is shining, you know, it's, it's okay, <laughs> we'll be all right. Um, is that, um, um, <laughs> it's actually a good thing for the UK to go for an FTA with a smaller economy. Um, UK is the world's fifth biggest economy. Um, the countries that I just described in the Commonwealth and the Asia region are smaller economies. And the reason is this. Um, the UK doesn't have, hasn't negotiated a trade deal since 1975, thereabouts. And um, the thing with trade is that it's complicated. Do you really want your first trade deal to be with Trump's America? He wants to win. <laughs> you know, he, America is a big beast. You are unlikely to get the best deal if you go for America as your first uh, FTA partner. You're better off going for a South Korea, or in the example of the Commonwealth, maybe um, an Australia, or a or uh, New Zealand, or Malaysia, or Singapore. You learn from the first deal, and then you take that learning to the next country, and then you say, well, this is what we've agreed, and then you basically build on that template. And that is a more pragmatic and learning by doing way of building in free trade agreements. So that's sort of my brighter note, that Asia countries, some of the ones that may be targets, are actually smaller and potentially more manageable in terms of how you could do a trade deal. Um, and, the, the, and, and again, trade experts I know make this point. You want a trade deal with a country that's big enough to have the e economic significance so that you actually get something for it, but not so big that if you completely screw it up, you're screwed. <laughs> so you want to have it big enough, but you can fail and learn. And I think that's essentially, perhaps, the kind of path that might work um, for Britain navigating um, a very um, different world. Um, and so one final bright note, and then I'll, I'll conclude, is that the UK in the Tory manifesto has said the section on trade, 84 pages, the section on trade is only two paragraphs. Um, and um, it's it, it said that the UK wants to replicate all existing EU trade agreements, FTAs. For the WTO schedules, it's possible for the UK to cross out the EU and put the UK um, it's called replication, and that's possible to do with some areas which are impossible to do around tariff-free quotas. It's possible for the UK to take CETA, another acronym, which is the EU-Canada Free Trade Agreement, cross out EU, write in UK um, as a starting point. So it may actually be faster if you're willing to accept the existing template, of which the UK has had input, but let's be clear here, the UK economy is very different than the EU economies. So you may well be accepting things that don't really benefit you very much, and you may be giving away things that may not be in your interest. So this is not a perfect solution. What I'm just suggesting is that we are not starting from scratch, but it's still going to take years. And um, oh, and just uh, my other little anecdote is CHOGAM, another acronym, which is the Commonwealth Heads of State's government meeting. Um, that, I think, has become a much bigger event the UK is gonna host it for the first time next spring. It's been redubbed the Commonwealth Summit of 2018. And the big hope is that India will come because the Commonwealth may be 2.3 billion people, 52 countries, but more than half of those are Indians. And the Indians are not as engaged in the Commonwealth as perhaps the Australians and the Canadians are. So I just want to pick you up on one thing there that leaves me 
a little depressed. What happens? I tried to end on a bright note. I know you did. I know you did, but it's a bright note to the future. But what happens on in March 2019? I mean, oh, yeah. w if question. these things take one year to 24 years to do, how do my shirts get into Marks and Spencers? How's all that going to work? Yeah, your shirts will be okay, but if okay. you wanted tomatoes, they'll probably go stale. Because the okay. day after Brexit, <laughs> what will happen is we will not have a free trade agreement with the European Union. Even two years is unlikely. They may have the bare bones of an agreement, but we won't have an agreement. That's pretty much acknowledged, I think, by both sides. So we go to WTO rules. WTO rules means customs checks for every single British um, traded good. So that means three things have to happen. Um, you need to have uh, customs declarations increase, you, IT system to cope with the kinds of declarations we only currently do for non-EU trade. Since EU trade is about half of what we trade, you have to double <laughs> the amount of um, customs declarations at least. Um, secondly, you need to have a um, way of checking goods at the border. So that means you need to have somewhere to park the lorries <laughs> um, at ports and uh, check cargo at, at airports. That's what I meant by the delays. Your shirt will be okay, but if a tomato sits in a port for uh, days, I may not get my avocado toast in the morning. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> um, and so I think the day after Brexit, we will be in the WTO, even if the WTO does not sign off on the UK's membership, and that is a very real possibility, because it takes unanimity. But either case, doesn't matter if they do or they don't, because the reality is the current EU regime goes away um, unless there is a transition or implementation period that extends the single market tariff-free customs union beyond March 2019. And that's being talked about. But my question on that, um, I have more questions than answers, is what are you transitioning to? <laughs> you are implementing, but you don't, but the government has said they don't want an indefinite period where you extend single market membership and ECJ rule. So that means you have to put a timeline on it. So if you're implementing or transitioning, what are you doing it towards? So the Germans have uh, proposed that we go into EFTA. I warned you about acronyms, which is the Norway model, that we do that as the transitional agreement, which means we still get pretty much unfettered access into the single market, but you would have to accept free movement of people in exchange. So any extension, even the Norway model or the Swiss model, includes free movement of people, something which I think, unless there was a definite timeline, politically may be difficult for this government. So I think the day after Brexit, that's the, that's the kind of coal face of what we're facing. And um, oh, so just to say, why I don't think it matters that the WTO thing doesn't get signed off is because if, if the WTO requires unanimity, but the WTO rules are that if a country wants to have a new schedule, which is what they're called, WTO tariff schedules, tariff rate quotas, if every country doesn't sign off, and there's 162 countries <laughs> that have to sign off, um, the old schedule applies. But for the UK, the old schedule is the same as the new schedule. <laughs> so okay. they haven't signed off on the EU's last three schedules after enlargement, and it's okay, because generally speaking, you just carry on. So I'm trying to reassure, I'm not doing a great job. Thank you. That's, uh, I'm no less or more depressed, but uh, thank you for clarifying. <laughs> How many jobs are we going to lose in the city to Europe and Dublin? And what do you think is the level of loss going to be? Because before they were saying it's going to be thousands, and now the banks are actually saying, yes, we are going to move jobs. HSBCs, recently JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, they're all setting up units and they're, they're, they're actually asking people. I mean, I've talked to people in Goldman Sachs and they said they're asking us, do we want to move to Europe? A lot of people are saying we don't want to move to Europe. Uh, how wonderful if we want to have optimism to hear that we're on the verge of seeing the end of extreme poverty in Asia, first of all. Good news. Um, Linda mentioned the uh, enthusiastic way in which Britain trades services, but you also said there's no easy game for you to engage in. If Britain is thinking about where to focus its service exports, what industries and areas should it be focusing on, and which countries should it be seeking to trade with? Okay, let's have one more from. Hello, hi. Hi. I'm Shah from Chinese Embassy. Uh, some of you mentioned about the 
uh, one day of one road initiative at the conference uh, several days ago. I just want to know that in light of the Brexit, uh, does Britain or Europe see that the initiative as some opportunities for further engage with Asia and how in specific terms uh, is Britain going to participate? Okay. Um, Lord Desai. The, 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 the jobs cuts and where we should focus? Yeah, well, on, on loss of jobs, uh, I think it will really depend upon whether the agreement will allow for some kind of equivalent rules to the passporting which are currently uh, in, in place, whereby the city can do business in every, every EU country. <coughs> if passporting is not allowed, then there will be a, a substantial movement of financial uh, companies across the Dublin, uh, most probably, or New York, uh, because that, then they will just operate like foreign companies operate in Europe. Uh, so that, that, that is one thing. And you know, it's very hard to get. I, I'm a uh, subcommittee of the European Union Committee, House of Law. We wrote a report on this, on Brexit and the city. And at that time, we were not at all sure which way the post-Brexit uh, rules will shape up. So that, that is a speculative way. Uh, I think that was more or less the same question about... Uh, it's where, where the services should focus. Is there any target area that we have? We have, we have, we have very good services in terms of uh, financial services, education and culture. Uh, and uh, I don't know what other you But it's legal, uh, as I was saying, in legal services, you see, we may want to export, but the people on the other side are also developing their own services sector. So I mean, India is not at all sure that they want the financial services from the UK. And we may be better than them, but they, they want to protect their own, own financial services. Certainly, the legal services, I know myself that we have been trying to enter into India's legal service sector since New Labour was in power. I mean, incredible number of minister for law I have entertained, or I mean, part of entertaining in the UK when they have visited uh, London. And India has refused to bear down <coughs> on legal services. So I don't think we should assume that just because we want to export, they want to import. Uh, mm -hmm. And we really have to appreciate the maturity of the Commonwealth countries, which have developed their own substantial services sector. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's one thing. Why are they engaged in an obsolete technology? Well, who wants to come from Beijing to London by train? Even, even goods can be much cheaper uh, conveyed by water. And the idea, and it is basically, I think it's an imperial folly on China's part. A Chinese imperial they folly. Money, they can waste it. But I don't think we should take any interest. There's a report by, um, I, I think the, the jobs estimates can't really be made accurately about city losses because the firms haven't made up their minds. Um, Oliver Wyman, I know, has done quite a few surveys trying to work out the actual numbers. So I think a lot of it, as Magna says, depends on what they think the, what especially international banks think the UK's access into the single market will be, and we won't know that for at least two years. Because remember, the European principle is that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So we won't know anything for sure until two years from now. Um, but I saw this article today uh, online, I can't remember which news outlet it was, and it said, why you don't want to move to Luxembourg? Apparently, culturally, they're not as fun as London. These things matter. These things do matter. <laughs> so, um, but if you're interested in that area, just keep an eye on Oliver Wyman. Um, in terms of um, service exports, um, it's the reason why we don't have TISA um, is because services sectors are, are protected. And they're protected because a lot of services are non-tradable. They're locally provided. A lot of uh, countries which have become newly middle income, the last thing they want is for multinational services companies to dominate their markets. They've learned their lessons from manufacturing. But I think that being said, um, there are comparative advantage suggests that there's a lot of learning to be had from uh, working with British services. And I mean this both in terms of not just high-end services, but also um, 
uh, business services, operations, all of these things. And the process of catching up by countries is to learn from those who are um, specializing in it. So in the same way that manufacturing allows catch up by partnering with joint ventures um, and taking foreign technology, services offers the same opportunities, except we are in a more protectionist era. So I think one market that I think is worth thinking about is ASEAN, because the uh, 10 countries of Southeast um, Asia have banded together. They now have a single market formed at the end of 2015 that has the same population as the European Union. They are essentially looking for, um, I was just in uh, Bangkok a couple of weeks ago, at the same conference that David Cameron said the Brexit bill is like a divorce bill. You have to pay first before you get to see the children. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think you got into a bit of trouble over that one. Um, but essentially, they are liberalizing services. They're trying to create a Schengen area. So there's areas to partner with them, but it's no, by no means it's not easy. But I just think ASEAN, they, they will probably overtake the EU in terms of GDP within the next decade or so, because they're growing at about 5 6%. The EU is growing about 1%, and they're not that far off. That doesn't mean they're rich. It just means that there's a lot of people. <laughs> um, and then finally, on OBER. OBAR, is it BRI? What BRI OBAR? now, I think it's it BRI is. Now, is that correct? BRI? Yes, both, okay. Um, it's, it's not clear to me how, um, if Brexit changes the UK calculus on that. In fact, I'd probably pose the question back to you the other way, which is, I've had a lot of Chinese business people um, ask me whether or not it's worth investing in the UK after Brexit um, if you no longer get unfettered access to the single market. So I think... Um, I think that has been, so I think in terms of, you know, OBAR, a, a trillion dollars, um, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's a lot of money, I think. <laughs> um, and, you know, the question is, uh, what is it that, is the UK after Brexit, is the golden era over? <laughs> Um, you know, what kind of participation would be useful given China has the resources mm. and the UK may well become, uh, have less, at least uncertain access to the biggest economic bloc in the world for a while. I, if I understood correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, that the UK sells more to Asia now than it does to the EU. That, that's been the case. Part of the narrative of the Brexit was that if we leave the EU, we will be free from the bondages to do what we want, each in Asia, including because we can sell our scotch whiskey to India. Does, does that hold water? I mean, if, 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 if I was able to do that in the EU, mm. sell more to the to Asia while in the EU, once I'm mm. out, would I be able to to sell more? Mm. Or, I mean, how does that dovetail? There's a lot of things that have been happening, yep. and they push under the rug and nobody talks about it. Okay. Yeah, so, so if you could wrap it in yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, no, 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 very yeah. interesting. Um, yeah. the, the, the UK trades more with the rest of the world than the EU. So it's not just Asia, it's also the United States. Um, it's also uh, Mexico has an FTA with the EU. So um, for instance, you know, it's cheaper to cost 10% to export a car from America. It's, you know, it doesn't cost anything if you export it from Mexico. So part of it is the Americas. Um, but generally speaking, that trend is, as you suggest, happening even while the UK is in the EU. I think um, trade, free trade agreements these days are complicated because of standards and regulations and non-tariff barriers. Um, that tends to be what makes it complicated. Um, and I think on those scores, there is more scope for the UK to, um, the UK probably has, is less hung up on some things like low-end manufacturing than uh, European countries. So that offers up a bit of scope. The reason I keep saying a bit is that, um, because trade agreements these days are not really about tariffs, and so it is about market access. So you can, ar you can argue this both ways. You can say the UK is free to pursue whatever standards it wants, but it's probably going to have standards which are very similar to what it currently has with the EU and the United States in terms of high standards. Um, but the UK is less likely to be hung up on agriculture and low end manufacturing. So I think in that sense, it might be easier for the UK as a less complicated economy rather than the heterogeneous EU to do a trade deal 
but the market access point is very touchy for new countries which have become newly middle class. Services, as Magna suggested, is actually very difficult. So it's not clear to me we are not going to relax our standards, in which case um, what we're free to pursue is, I guess, we're less concerned about some areas than, than others. But all the complications these days are not around tariff rates. Tariff rates are really low for manufactured goods under the WTO. Um, cars, which is our biggest manufactured exports, attracts tariffs of 10%. Um, everything else is much lower than that, 2 3%. So that's not the, that's not the impediment. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to this after the break. And just to say, Cyprus and Malta are the only remaining Commonwealth members in the EU, so you can't be on the side. You're going to be front and center, <laughs> whether you like to or not. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Humphrey, uh, well, a brief answer to that is not on its own. Um, trade is not a single uh, streets down which a few people flow. It's a very complex city across the world and there is no single solution and there's no single pathway. So um, anything within the Commonwealth has got to be seen in the, in the guise of regional trade and global trade and of course one of those phenomena is Brexit and the impact of that. Um, a, my organisation's job is to look at, the work, look at uh, trade through the eyes of businesses and we're established as a business under the, uh, within the scope of the Commonwealth, but we're not part of its, uh, its bureaucracy. Um, I, I, I want to say very little about Brexit itself, except I, I do feel there is a, an important negotiating advantage the British government could have, which of course is to threaten to stay in. Uh, and basically threaten the European Union, and unless they get a good deal, we will stay. And I happen to feel they're probably so fed up of us now that they will pay almost any price that is worth paying to get rid of us. Um, I think there is a danger of looking at both Brexit and also the Commonwealth through British eyes. I mean, the vast majority of people in the Commonwealth are not British. The vast majority of people in the Commonwealth were not born during empire. And the vast majority of people in the Commonwealth were either just don't understand this phrase, Empire 2.0, which I have to say, I was in the, a part of the Foreign Office when that happened, and I have to say, most people in the FCO just put their hand, head in their hands with despair as this latest wise uttering appeared from the Department of International Trade. Um, but most people in the Commonwealth uh, probably don't even recognise the Commonwealth exists, so its biggest task is to actually get it on the radar of people there. Um, I'm fairly positive about how the Commonwealth may benefit from the process of Brexit. And that's not commenting on whether Brexit was a good idea or not. It does help us, I think, in this world to have a new player on the block that is probably more in favour of free trade and liberal trade markets than the organisation it seconded its trade negotiations to. So Britain, I think, is instinctively more free trade and more liberal trade than the European Union. That means I think it has, as the fifth largest economy in the world, has swung the balance a bit more away from protectionist policies and a, and a, and a, and a world that can basically believe that it's possible to do a deal where you measure your success not just in terms of what you achieve, but by how much the other person loses, which I think is the fear of the Trump dimension of trade. Um, I think we are heading for a world which is going to be dominated by bilateral deals more than by multilateral deals. In fact, if there are any multilateral deals to be had, I, I think Brexit is probably going to be the last. Um, but it is going to be a world which is going to demand and use standards and facilitation and predictability in world trade. These are almost become, they are more achievable and they are more likely and therefore they are more in demand, I think, by businesses. One size does not fit all. It's perfectly possible for countries to have different trade arrangements with each other, uh, but they can still be underpinned by standards and facilitation objectives, which are the same. Um, I think a couple of things I'd just like to focus on is, one is the rise of knowledge as a tradable commodity. And Linda has pointed out that knowledge, of course, comes from services, and services, there are virtually no trade agreements in the world covering services. Of course, I'd argue there actually isn't a free trade agreement anywhere in the world, um, but there certainly isn't one for services and knowledge. But what does knowledge require? Well, I think it requires three important things which are under threat. First of all is the, th the free movement of talent, uh, and that includes students, 
It does include getting a visa regime that is mildly fit for purpose, and anyone who hasn't got a European Union passport queuing at Heathrow will know that there is the British do not have a visa regime that is even in any way fit for purpose. Um, and it does require uh, people to have a visa regime which is both fair but also fast. Uh, and most countries in the Commonwealth, with a few exceptions, in two, including the two I was in last week, Singapore and Malaysia, do not have fast visa regimes. In fact, it might be argued that one country in the Commonwealth uh, that is not in the Commonwealth but could have been if it hadn't uh, gone to China is Hong Kong. And that probably has one of the fastest regimes, if you like, in the historic empire. Second thing is uh, intellectual property. The protection and trade, and therefore the tradeability of intellectual property is of crucial importance to knowledge. If people don't believe they can hang on and earn a legitimate living without anyone stealing their intellectual property, it is going to become more and more of a problem as knowledge becomes the dominant tradable commodity. And then finally, um, and I look at my, my old friend and colleague, Xiao Zheng, from China on this, because this is somewhere where China, I think, is going to come a cropper, is the basis of this is going to be a free, neutral, single internet across the world. And I'm afraid we're seeing too many countries across the world, and some of them in the Commonwealth, who do not believe in a free, neutral, single internet. And I believe that is one of the most profound trading barriers, as well as political barriers, the world faces. So what does the UK need to do? Well, first of all, I think it's got to become a strong advocate of a positive non-zero-sum game. In other words, to go into negotiations and say, we don't believe these are going to succeed unless the people we negotiate with get a good deal as well. So it's not just looking for the deal for yourself, it's deliberately looking for the deal for the other person. I think it's got to have far less rhetoric and actually get down to negotiation, though the chance of doing that before the 8th of January is pretty remote. But I think it's also got to recognise that the Commonwealth is more, much more than any interaction with Britain. I think the Commonwealth and individual Commonwealth nations, and it will change from one to the other, are going to get far more out of Brexit than the Britain, Britain will get out of the Commonwealth as a con consequence of Brexit. And I think Britain needs to wake up to that. Um, I think we have to accept the fact that there are some good lessons for the Commonwealth around the world, in ASEAN, in APEC, um, sorry, Asian Pacific Economic Council, uh, ASEAN, but ASEAN and APEC also have a problem in that the diversity of wealth is very, very extreme. It's not like the European Union. And so we have to, in, in terms of enabling Commonwealth trade, recognise that wealth diversity amongst Commonwealth nations is extreme and opportunity is extreme. Commonwealth contains uh, the biggest na second biggest nation on earth. It also contains the tiniest nations on earth. So the idea that you can create a single free market trade zone for the entire Commonwealth just is not a non-starter. But what you can do is create a set of rules and you can go for a single set of facilitation objectives which enable all countries within the Commonwealth to trade much more fluidly with each other. I think will also help the Commonwealth with uh, Cyprus and Malta being the only Commonwealth nations in the European Union. <laughs>